good morning again. This is already day three. Um, time is flying. Uh, what I will start with today is uh, taxonomic standards. Mike went through the whole OBIS scheme and all the information that you need to uh, have a good data set. And in this presentation or in this session, I will focus on the taxonomy. Because if you're dealing with distribution data and uh, Afrobis and Afrimas, then your taxonomy is uh, very important. I'd like to start with a quote, actually, which I very much like and which is <laughs> very, very true in the sense that uh, sometimes they say that taxonomy is a science or an art. But if you actually dive into it and if you're really involved in taxonomy, then you find that it's actually really a battleground trying to figure out the correct names, uh, taxonomic experts trying to agree on which name should be the correct one, and so on. Okay, so taxonomy within Afremas and Afrobis is actually the common denominator, which means that the taxonomy is what links Afrobis and Afremas together. And uh, I think you're all familiar with the definitions of taxonomy, so um, I won't go into detail. I'll just point out that there's different international codes. There's one for zoology and there is one for botany. So there might be some um, subtle differences in how a taxonomic name is built or how you should uh, write it down um, between zoology and uh, uh, botany. But in most cases, what you deal with is um, a higher classification or a higher ranking, which is down here. So you mostly start at kingdom and you end at uh, species level. Now, taxonomy is very prone to human errors and variation. Um, mostly we say it nicely. Someone made a spelling variation instead of actually saying that they made a spelling mistake. And um, we do know it's hard because some names are really hard to spell. And this is an example of one. So the correct name is the one in bold, the one at the top here. If the arrow wants to work here. This is the correct one. And then I've listed, and this is not fiction. These are actual uh, spelling variations that we have already encountered in some way, us or other systems that uh, use taxonomy. So you see it's sometimes really, really hard to uh, write a taxonomic name or scientific name correctly. So if you would get a list with all these variation, your question would still be, which one is the correct one? And to be able to distinguish the correct one between all those, you do need to use a controlled taxonomic vocabulary. And that is where worms and afrimas come into play. Okay. Um, not only human errors, but also computer errors, in the sense that most people use the automatic series filling within Excel. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So you have one cell in Excel where you put something and then you can drag it down and then it copies everything. Uh, that's very nice for uh, letters, but it's really hard for numbers because sometimes the system just adds a number to uh, the number that you give. So, so far you could still be, if you're not familiar with this uh, herring species, you could still be like any one of those could be correct. But if you continue and you start going into the future, then you really know that something is wrong. So it's really important to, to check for that too. And also here worms can help because worms also captures the uh, authorities of a species name, of a taxon name. So you also can check if that is correct or not. Okay. Um, there's also, so I said you have spelling variations, but there's also in some cases several ways to correctly spell a name. And that mostly goes to um, what you put behind the species name. So in this case, we're looking at a variety or a subspecies. And again, the arrow is bugging me. Okay, so you can have var borealis, uh, var borealis again. You can have the authorities written within or between the species and the variety. You can have the short version of your, okay. You can have the short version of your authority, just being panel. Or you can have, in botany, the long version, saying Pennell described it first, then it was adapted by Zinkert, and this was done in 1934. So all these names are actually correct ones. It's just a different way of displaying them. And this would be a second example. So again, you have the authorities in different places. You have 
variety or not variety and subspecies or wait, down here. You can also say subspecies or SSP means subspecies. These are all different kind of short terms that can go within the scientific name and still making it a correct scientific name. Then var variation in the author name itself. So this species has been originally described by Müller in 1773. But again here there's different ways of writing the author name. So they can abbreviate it to the first four letters. Um, they can have it with the umlaut, which is actually the correct spelling in German. They can have it with or without the initials of the author. Uh, they can have, again, struggling with the arrow here. So they can have their, Müller has originally described it, but then Berg has put it in another genus in a later stage to be, uh, to have it in the correct classification. Um, that can be with or without with or without the year of publication, and so on. So it's important that you also not only pay attention to the scientific name, the genus and the species, but also to the authority. Um, taxonomy itself is, is complicated. People that have already dealt, dealt with species names know that it's not an easy subject. And so far, I only dealt with possible variations in how you write something, but there's also variations in the name that you use for a specific species. And the first case would be synonymy. So I have a species here, which is a, a sponge, a breadcrumb sponge. And in history, it has been described more than 60 times under a different name, but it's actually all the same. I just list here the different uh, species names for that specific species that you see on the picture and just by looking at the picture you can kind of understand the confusion that was there in the past when they described it because it looks very different it has a different color it has a different shape but actually it's one and the same species so it's important within your data sets that you know if you are dealing with a synonym name or an accepted species name uh, next to synonym or synonymy, there's also homonymy, which means that um, you have a name for a taxon, which is identical, but it refers to two different species in two different groups. They just use the same name. Um, this just happens in history. If people describe species and you're focusing on sponges, then you're not really always aware of what they are doing, for example, in the birds or in the insects. So it might be possible that two different species get the same name. Uh, the thing is that only one of those two names can stay valid. So taxonomists then have to look at it, have to apply the, the rules of the international code to define which of the two names was the the oldest one or the, the first one in use and then they have to find a different name for uh, the other one. Um, just some examples. This is uh, the genus Morea. Um, I have it there one, two, three, four, five, six times and it's six different things with the same name. Just, just to show you that it's not only two but it can be a lot more so it was first uh, described by this guy, Le Maire, in 1855, belonging to the plants. And then all the names coming after it that were also named Morea um, had to be changed in the sense that they had to put into synonym with another name. So in here at the end, you can see for those five, which one is now the accepted name. So homonymy is important in the sense that if you get a data set you have to know uh, what you are dealing with um, i'll use the same example you have a sponge and an insect with the same name if you're dealing with a sponge data set then you can be pretty sure that you can follow the sponge name that was assigned to that species if it's um and not, and not the insect name it becomes more tricky when you have a mixed data set some uh, monitoring data sets compile everything together, they have bentos, plankton, birds, mammals, reptiles, everything in, in one data set. And then it can become hard to distinguish between the different homonyms. And um, in that case, we always advise to the data providers to have at least the authority 
the, the, the person who described the species and the year of publication with the name, because they can help you distinguish between the different homonyms. So if I would just have Morea in a mixed data set, then I have no idea what they are talking about. But if I have Morea combined with the authority, then it becomes very easy to link it to the correct species name. Is that kind of clear for everyone? The OK. Uh, I'm using the same example as Mike did yesterday here. Um, so in, in the marine environment, you have this genus Alibion, which is on one part a parasitic copepod and on the other part uh, a sponge. So again here, important to know the context of your data set. If you know you're dealing with copepods, you can easily uh, assign it to the correct name. Now, all these variations, how can we deal with it? Um, this already became clear, I think, on Monday and Tuesday, is that we try to link all the taxonomic names from a data set to the World Register of Marine Species, <clears throat> or to AFREMAS. Because WORMS is the standard list of marine taxonomic names, which can really help you distinguish between the different names and, and gives you an authoritative basis for it. Um, here, important, if you have a species name or a taxon name that you cannot link or not match with worms, then um, we advise you to just contact us at info at and uh, we contact the taxonomic experts. Uh, first step would actually be that you go back to your data <coughs> provider and say, I cannot match this name with the World Register. Could you have a look at it, please? Because what can happen sometimes is, um, as an example, they have a paper data set and they digitize it and they go through it line by line manually. What can happen is that two lines get switched. If you have a genus column and a species column, it might be that they mix them up instead of going like this. They kind of cross them. And if they just go back to their data set and check that, that can already solve the issue and then you don't need to contact us. But if your provider says like, no, this is a correct name, this is how it is in the publication or in the data set, then you can come to us and we consult with our taxonomic experts. Very important is that you always safeguard or keep the name that was originally delivered. So if someone would deliver species A, then it's important that you keep that species A and in a second column, you match it with what is available in worms but I'll get back to that later. Okay. Uh, just an example. And this is also something that needs to be clear. If you have one data set and you only work with one data set, then that taxonomic check might not be that important because you have your species list within your data set and then you're fine. But from the minute you start combining your data set with other data sets, then it becomes really important that you know what you are dealing with. And I'm giving an example here. This is an actual example. We had this case. So four different data sets. Those are the four names that we got. And you see that the differences are very subtle. We have, a, if the arrow wants to work, yes. So here we have an R, there we have a V, here the E is missing, and here we have a double L. Okay, four names four differences. But if you match this to the World Register of Marine Species, you see that's actually all one and the same species, only there have been spelling variations or spelling mistakes in the names that were delivered. So you see this is really important that you know that you have to work with this one name. I'll have another example on this, which will really show the importance of that. Again, real cases. These were data sets that we uh, received. And um, it's about rocky shore data, benthic data, and pelagic data. And what we've done is we've looked at the data before the quality control. So we looked at the number of species and the number of rare species. Number of rare species is the species where we only had one observation within a data set. Okay? And I just picked out here two example, uh, two regions for the arrow gone. Sorry, Claudia, I'll just do it like this. You have the Arctic and you have the Mediterranean. And what we see is for the Arctic, we had originally 646 species, of which 69 were rare species. Same for the Mediterranean, 420 species in total. 
103 rare species. This is before quality control. Once we match it with the World Register of Marine Species and we clean everything up, this is what we get. So you see for the Arctic, the number of species is almost halved. We go from over 600 to less than 400. Also the rare species, we go from almost 70 to a little bit more than 40. Those are really big differences. If you don't take that into account, and that's actually the next step, if you don't take that into account, that taxonomic quality control, and you keep using all those different spelling variations, what you are actually doing is introducing rare species or new species into your biodiversity system, which are actually not there, which means that you get a wrong view of the actual biodiversity of your system. And it's better that you have a slight underestimation of your biodiversity instead of really overestimating it by not taking into account synonyms and spelling variations. Now, this was all pure taxonomy. You have a name and you have to work with the name. The next step is that scientists don't always know exactly what species they are dealing with. And this is sometimes when if I'm processing a data set, I'm getting a headache because this is what gives the, the problems. Now, what scientists sometimes do is uh, identify uncertain identifications. And I think all of you have already seen this. They use SPA1, SPA A, SPA X, whatever. They can also say it's an affin it has an affinity with a certain species, but it's not exactly that species. And the really nice ones are that they are doubting between two species or two taxa, and they just put both of them in their data set. So that would be the, the third example. Now, in all these cases, if you're doing um, data management, taxonomic quality control, is that you link what you have to the first higher taxonomic level, the first level that they are certain about. Because if they say species one, that means they're not certain which species it is, so you actually need to go to the genus level. And the genus level is the level that you will be using in your uh, data set. Some examples to make this clear. Two data sets, again, real examples, no fiction. I didn't create this. This really is a, is a fact. So we have one data set from Spain, which has SPA1 and SPA2. We have a similar data set on Mayofauna. These are nematodes um, from Greece, and they used the same uh, terminology. They also had the genus Acantholimus and they had a species 1 and a species 2. Now within each data set itself it's not a problem to use species 1 and species 2 but the moment you want to combine them that's when you have to be careful because you could go like this the species 1 from Spain could be identical to the species 1 from Greece the same for the species 2 or it could cross the species 1 from Spain could be the species 2 from Greece. We don't know. Another option is that none of them match and they actually should be linked to a third species. Again, we don't know. So because we don't know, what we do is you don't work with the Acantholimus spa 1, but you work with Acantholimus, just the genus, because that is the only certain thing you can say about it. Um, if you would want to clear this out, that would actually be a scientific job in the sense that specimens should be compared to be able to figure it out. But on the data management level, we, we don't do that. What, what you do need to know is that if you do this, and this is for Eurobis, this is for Afrobis, this is for Obis in general, we do have a loss of biodiversity by working this way because they know it's a specific species and they might have three different ones within their data set, but we just say it's the genus. And again, I'm coming back to what I said earlier, an underestimation is better than an overestimation of your biodiversity. So this is why we work like this. Then uh, scientists can also use the terms confer, the CF that you see sometimes, and also the affinity. Um, if they use that, that means it looks like. It's not exactly it, but it looks like it. So very important here is if you have the species name on the left and the confer on the right, the confer needs to be matched to the genus because they're not sure it's the same species. There's a difference there. The same for the use of the affinity. 
the left one is not the same as the right one. You do need to um, clean out the affinity and go to the genus level. Okay, is this clear for everyone so far? Yes? Then the, oh, I'm missing something here. Okay, so I said sometimes they're not sure even on the genus and they say it could be one or the other, which is the first example here, the Aphelogaita and the Gaitozone, uh, two genera. So what you need to do in that case is identify it to the higher classification that matches both genera. So actually the first common higher level. And I'm just showing that here in the first part of the slides, if the arrow wants to work. Okay. So what I've just done is for the two genera, is look up the higher classification in worms. And I've listed it here. And then you can see at the end that they actually both belong to the same family. Which means that if you get something like this, two genera, you link it to the first level that matches it, which is in this case the family. They can also do it on a species level, saying we're sure this is the genus, but we're not sure about the species. In this case, it's easy. You just go to the genus. This is the same as the SPA1 and SPA2 uh, examples that I gave. And then another example of two genera, this makes it more complicated because if you write out the whole classification, you see that you actually need to go back three levels before you find a common uh, part of the classification here. So this is the one that you need to use. Okay. Silence. <laughs> okay. Uh, very important also as a data manager is that you try to avoid abbreviated names. And what I mean by this is this is also a, an example that we got. So scientists, if, if you read a publication and there are scientific names in there, if the scientific name is repeated often, they don't write the genus in full anymore. They use the first letter of the genus and then the species name. So what they do sometimes is they also put it like that in their data set. So you would have Calanus finmarchicus and then C. affinis, which you should also read as Calanus affinis, Calanus pacificus, and so on. But then the, sec the second genus that they're dealing with is Caligulus. They put C. affinis, and so on. Can you already see where I'm going with this? Kind of, yes. If you would have your data set and you would sort it alphabetically, this is what you get. Okay, but because we have an, um, where is it? We have an, use the arrows, sorry. No, no, I'll do it like this. We have here an A affinis for a specific genus. We have another A affinis for another genus. They're all listed on top together. So if you have not cleaned that out, which, by which I mean that you need to write your genus name in full, you're gonna get into trouble because you have no idea anymore how to link it if you didn't save the original version. So that's why this is very important. If you get a data set, is first look at the scientific names and make sure that they are all written in full. That makes your job a lot easier, okay? That was the last example actually. Um, are there any questions on this? No? Everything clear? Yeah. Yes? Stupid question for me. If you submit data to OVID, is it, or, or if in your database, would you store GNET and species name in different columns? Uh, no, you can have it in one column as okay. scientific name. Yeah, okay. It's no problem to have it together because in the, the next presentation will be on the quality control and we start from a column scientific name. But sometimes your provider just splits it up. It's, it's the same, because if you have the genus and the species separate, it's very easy to concatenate them, to bring them together into one column, which you then call scientific name. That's, uh, that's what you can do. OK. Uh, and when you're looking at uh, data that has been collected through the expedition and the test process, and you find that some kind of use um, wrong legal name. Yes. Well, how can you see? 
what, um, what we mostly do is so you get the data set, you process it and you find the mistake. That's what happens. What you do is you send an email to your data provider being very polite, <laughs> not saying you made a mistake, but try to be polite. Is it possible that maybe you made a, an error there in spelling and then refer to the World Register of Marine Species or to AFRIMAS where you can actually show online this is how the taxonomic expert says that it is correctly spelled. And then it's up to the provider if he wants to change it or not. It might be that he's very happy that you said this might be a spelling error and he will correct it and will make use of that correctly spelled name. But we also had cases where the data provider is like, yeah, yeah, fine, thanks, but he keeps using the wrongly spelled name, which is just something that you need to deal with then and know that if you see that name, that you have to match it to the correctly spelled name. Yes. And when I come to, to you back, uh, and this means so that this uh, we we don't we have some kind of uh, a type of uh, marine species mm -hmm. that uh, are in our for the mixed waters, and we we didn't find that that species, and we so we, we don't know how to to identify that species because if you okay. go to another uh, another book another guide. We don't find that species, and it's difficult to know who identified that species because it was a, a, a huge group mm -hmm. of most of people coming from outside the country. So it's difficult to identify, and it's difficult to know who is the, the data provider. Yeah, but you always have one person that sends you the data set yes, as a right. contact. And yeah. that is your only link. So the only thing that in that case where you say it's a big group and you don't know who has identified a certain species, the only thing you can do is give feedback to your contact person and say, we're not sure if this is correct because, and you give some reasons. And that's all you can do. Because we, we have to learn to live with the fact that we will never be able to clean up every data set to make it 100% correct. That's the case for Eurobus, that's the case for Afrobus, but that's even more the case for Obis, because they are compiling everything from everywhere. So there's bound to be mistakes in a system like that. And we do try to deliver the highest quality possible, but we have to live with the fact that we won't be able to solve everything. Okay? There was another, Sylvie? <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the author name. Okay. okay, it's not a problem if you don't have the author name. We can still do a matching just on the scientific name. It's just that if there is doubt, if there would be two or three identically the same names with only a difference in the authority, then you won't be able to sort out to which one you need to link it. So that will remain an unmatched species unless you can go back to your provider and and check if he has somewhere the the author names available yeah but we can have a look at it uh later this morning that's good okay yes <laughs> 